I'm just reminding you what we've done for the last three months. Um, uh, so, so that just to remind you, maybe what I'll do is I'll give you an outline of the topics we covered, and then I'll come back and address those topics. So, first thing we did in the class is we talked about integration. And in particular, we focused on techniques of integration, which include substitution. Uh, integration by parts, which in case you forgot what that is, is that the integral of u to v is uh, the integral of u v is the integral of v to u. Um, I don't remember the order exactly, but certainly we did partial fractions. String substitutions. Oh. Let me call this instead of three integrals, let me call this integrals of powers sine or cosine. So Everyone remember what all these things are? Not necessarily how to do them? No. Not the bottom one. So the bottom one is like how you would do an integral like sine q of x uh, or cosine squared of x dx. Something like that. This one would be an integral involving something like dx or I don't know. Uh, let's say uh, one minus x squared to the fourth, something like that. This one, well, you just have to do it for the way this thing. This is to let you split up uh, something that's factored. So something like the integral of dx. Minus three, two x plus one, something like that. Okay, so so those are the various techniques of integration. I will come back and do examples of all of them in a little bit. Let me just fill up the board with an outline, and then we'll come back and do stuff. I think that's it for sort of techniques of integration, and then there's some other. Uh, so there's stuff about improper integrals. These are things like the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx, or the integral from 0 to 3 of 1 over x minus 1, dx over x minus 1, things like that. Things where the integral flows up or the bounds of integration are undefined. Okay? So we did this sort of thing. It messed up a lot. A lot of people got confused about it. I think it may make a little more sense now that you're a little more familiar with series and so on where you use some of these techniques again and again. And then there were also things like um, numerical integration. So this included things like the trapezoid rule. Midpoint. And it also included, uh, so there's also, um, you know, error estimates. Um, so 
this is the thing with the hammer. I don't know. This is the thing where you know you, you say the Simpson's rule with four intervals. How far off is it from the real? So that's uh, chapter five, I think. And I think it's everything in chapter five that we covered. Let me just look to make sure. I just feel like I forget something. Yeah, okay. And so that's the, yeah, that's the stuff in chapter five. Then other stuff that we did was applications of this stuff. And it all sort of flows together in one, but so beyond just doing integrals, we have things like area between curves. Volumes, uh, and this includes where you know the cross section. Also, surfaces of revolution. So, right, the washer method, the disk method, whatever. Um, <laughs> so, we have some curve, and we want to find how long it is.
Maybe they're special of some sort, so maybe they're telescope. That means that the terms cancel out as you go up. Um, maybe it's a geometric series. Uh, so that means that it looks like something R is less than one in absolute value, then this adds right to the yeah. uh, Okay, so we have those. There were some recursive ones, which means that the later terms are defined in terms of the earlier terms. Um, and then we just have, so these are sort of the special ones. And then we have the tests for the arbitrary ones that we can use to determine these. So we have, say, we have, oh, we have an integral test. We have the comparison test. We have limited comparison. Uh, we have the ratio test, and let's flip off the series. The ratio test, I think that's pretty much it. Is there any things that I omitted that people like? I don't think so. So the main ones that, well, those are the ones. Um, and so these are to tell us so it tells us when some series <coughs> converges, but not necessarily when it converges to. And then related to that, we have, so So, okay, and then we have Taylor and Warren series. Which I guess, well, before that, I guess the power series, which Taylor and McLaurin are special cases. Uh, value, say C, and this tells us that f of x 
the value of c plus the derivative times the distance from c. So this is just the tangent line. And then the second derivative is the two factorial x minus c squared. And the third derivative This is the Taylor series. The Glorin series is just Taylor where C is zero. Um, so this is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative. Oh, I forgot all the names here. The nth derivative evaluated at some point divided by n factorial of x minus c to the n. So here I forgot what the name And again, with Taylor series, because it's just a special kind of power series, um, this, again, has an interval of convergence, a radius of convergence, that sort of thing. Together with this, we also have an arrow bound, similar to the other thing, where we can say if we go up to five terms and stop, how much are we off? Um, and there are a bunch of Taylor series, which you know. You should know, for example, well, the geometric series. Uh, exponential series. So e to the x is uh, the one plus x squared plus, so it's x to the n over n factorial sine, let me just not write the means, but cosine, the log, etc. So there's a bunch of these, which are ones that we tend to know, and then either derive the Taylor series directly by just taking derivatives over and over and over and over again, or if we wanted a Taylor series for something like e to the 5x, we just plug in here, or if we want a Taylor series for um, the integral of x sine x, then we can multiply sine x by x, and then integrate term by term, and so on. So, <laughs> so we can manipulate these guys to get other guys. And I think that's and put the arrow down there. I think that's it for the series. Yep. And then, lastly, we have differential equations. So, in terms of differential equations, we have really only two kinds that we've studied. So, there's, there's well, first the idea of um, direction field. There's Euler's method. This reminds me here where I said complex numbers. Where did they go? Somewhere I put complex numbers. There we go. So this includes uh, 
one with formula, but there's one with method, which is the numerical method for, for approximating the differential equation. And then there's ways of solving them. <coughs> so really, the only way that we have of solving them is if it's separable. There are other methods, but we didn't study them. So if the equation is separable, we just separate, integrate both sides and solve. You should have been doing a lot of that lately. And then we also have the second order linear equations. Something like y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals zero, where we find the characteristic polynomial, plug in, go for it. And then we look at a specific case, specific cases of these separable equations, uh, exponential. Variations of that. So exponential models like which are the differential equation like y prime equals constant times y, the logistic equation, which is y prime equals constant times y times one minus p over m. Y over m. Something like that. And then we have some variations like on the paper homework that's here this week or on the problems that I got a lot of emails and piazza noises about at the end of the last assignment. Um, and then we also have these, uh, let me just call it space and plane. what we did last time. So in terms of the phase plane, well, I said at the end of the last class that you can interpret these things in terms of the phase plane by making the substitution and turning it into a pair of first order equations and make a picture. We're not going to do that. However, the stuff with the uh, aphids and ladybugs or rabbits and foxes, or dingoes and whatever they were, um, that is fair game. So I think this is everything. Does anyone remember anything that I missed? No? So we're good. Okay. So, just know this, you're fine. How many would you like there to be? You want one question? You want one question? You want one? I can write a test with one problem. You will be very sad. Write a test with one problem. That's what you want. So how many would you like? Then why do you ask this question? It's a completely meaningless question. The test is two and a half hours long. How many would you like? Why does it matter? How many questions? Yeah, that's what I'm, we're discussing. That's a stupid question. Don't ask it. Because, I mean, if I tell you, okay, there's 10 problems. Does that mean anything? Yes. What does it mean? And so, how does that affect your life in any way? There's 10 problems. It takes you two and a half hours to do 10 problems. If I tell you there's 100 problems. So? Yeah. Yes. So there will be a heavier focus on these two boards. Heavier focus means if there are ten problems, but if there are ten problems, then maybe five of them will be from this, or four or five. So forty to fifty percent will be on this stuff. And 50 to 60 percent will be on this stuff. So that means like, huh? Well, you have not had any tests on this material. You've only had homework on this material. 
So that means that this is midterm three plus the final. So if you view it that way, it's not that this is more important. Although, for many, many, for many, uh, okay, so let me, blah, 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 blah. For those of you that are going on in science and engineering and will be using math more, especially engineering, but also physicists and, and a lot of other areas of math, this thing of Taylor series, which seems completely artificial and weird, is extremely important. It comes up a lot. Uh, this business about differential equations is very important in science. Uh, you have to be able to do integrals, but really it's not that important if you're really good at integrals, because in applications, well, you should be able to understand what an integral is. Computers can do them, tables can do them, or if you can't do them, you do them numerically by using, say, Euler's method, or, well, actually, better methods like uh, Roman <laughs> or things like that. So that's not so crazy important to be able to do integrals, but still, you know, that's part of what we do here. So you, you shouldn't, I mean, obviously, if you can't do a very simple integral, like x e to the x, then you can go, yeah. Are there questions for like, errors things? Yeah. Do have to have the configuration for the browser again? No. So, the, well, yes and no. So, in, in, in this, there are equations for telling you what the error bound is. I don't remember them. Why should I expect you to remember them? So if I am going to ask you, say, a Simpsons rule problem, just like on the midterm, I will remind you what the relevant formula is. You have to know how to use that formula. On the other hand, the alternating series error is just the next term that you didn't use. That's pretty easy to remember. The error in Taylor series is essentially the next term. It's just not quite at the same place. I may or may not choose to remind you of that. Uh, on these work problems, I don't expect you to remember the volume of constants. I'll remind you of the volume of the cones because the question of pumping water out of the tank. I won't remind you how to use similar triangles. Uh, I won't remind you how to find the volume of the square. I hope you could find the volume of this volume. Bottom of the square is zero, so that's easy. I won't remind you how to find the area of the square. But if you need to find the area of an octagon, maybe I'll remind you how to do that. Um, so the standard things that you should have learned in fifth grade, I'm not going to remind you of. I'm also not going to remind you that 5 times 7 is 35. Um, but I might, remember, might remind you what 3 to the 11 is, if you need that. Uh, okay, other formatting type questions? You still want to know how many questions? So if I tell you uh, 18, does that make you happy? I haven't decided because I haven't written it yet. <laughs> 18 is a possible number. It doesn't mean there will be anything, but somewhere like in the range between 10 and 20, it's about one. Um, okay, other questions? No? We're good? So we should just like cancel class for the rest of the time? I'm happy with that. I don't have yeah, I'm happy too with that. Okay, so I should just start reviewing that. There's no more? Okay. So, should I start at the beginning and go to the end, or are there specific things? Okay, so let's start at the beginning and go to the end. So, let me remind you of the most simple thing where I have an equation like, I mean, an integral like the integral of 
1 over log of x, 1 over, 1 over x log x, yes. So if I have something like this, how would I do this? Substitution. This is an obvious substitution because when you're doing substitution, you have to remember you're going to make u equal something, and you shouldn't forget the dm. Yeah. Yeah. And the biggest mistake, the, so the people who are going to get like 4 on the final are the people who don't remember the du. So by now, I shouldn't need to remember, remind you that when you make a substitution, there's two parts. Yet I kept, keep seeing it even from the good students. So we do that, and then this becomes very easy. So du is 1 over x and x, so there's du right in my face. And now this is an easy integral. This is just a log. And then u was the log of x. So this is the log of the log. I guess there's another x. So this is a very easy substitution problem. The other thing that sometimes people screw up when they do substitution is if this had a definite integral, like from uh, 3 to 5, then I don't, I don't ever have to go back to x here, because if this were, say, the integral from 3 to 5, and 2 x over x log x, then when I do u equals log x, then when x is 3, u is the log of 3, and when x is 5, u is the log of 5, and so then this just becomes the integral from log 3 to log 5 of the u over u. And I get the same answer. So when you stop. Okay? So substitution, this should be easy. The only trick in substitution is sometimes the, the integrals. It's not obvious exactly what substitution to make. We got to the rule. There will be at least one substitution on the one. That'll be sort of three points. Uh, okay, I still want to erase this. Okay. So more more to the point would be something like integration by parts. That was like the first real topic that we did in this class. So integration by parts, we have something like the integral of e to the 2x times x dx. Again, this could be an indefinite integral or it could be definite. Doesn't really matter. So here. When we, when we see when we see an integral that if you take the derivative, it's a product. Maybe it can be a hidden product because maybe it could be a product of dx. But when you take the derivative of one piece and it gets better, and you can integrate the other piece and it gets no worse, then parts is likely. So there's this little thing that I hate, but okay. A lot of people remember this Lippitz or Yate to try and remember which one you do first. So logs are good, and if you don't see a log, then you do. Uh oh, what does the I stand for? Uh, inverse trig, and then either um, algebraic trig and exponential, or polynomial. So either one of those things. And you should know by now, because of this, 
why there's these two things where exponential and trig can come in either order. Because exponential and trig are really the same thing. Okay, when we have this, we want to pick out one thing to be u and another thing to be dv. So in this case, when we take the derivative of an exponential, it gets no better. But we can also integrate exponential. When we take the derivative of, a, of an x, it gets better. So we should take u equal x and dv being equal to x dx. And so then du is dx. And v is, well, I have to integrate this. So this is 1 half e to the 2x. And so then this becomes uv minus the integral of v du. So uv is 1 half x e to the 2x minus the integral of 1 half e to the 2x dx. And so then I just do that integral. And I get 1 half x equals 2x minus 1 quarter equals 2x plus 1. Okay, so integration by parts is very straightforward. Sometimes you have to manipulate it so something like say the integral of e to the x prime x dx. This is one of the ones, does anyone want me to do this example? This is one where I integrate by parts once, I get something, I integrate by parts again, and I get this same integral in there, and then I solve for the integral. So things that tend to be exponentials times trig have this property that if you integrate by what that. If you integrate by parts twice, you sort of get back where you started, and then you can solve. You get back where you started plus some other jump. And then you can solve for it, then you started with, with the other jump. Does anyone need me to do this example? Yes. Or like it? So I'm saying yes. Absolutely not. OK, so I'll do it. So it's standard nonsense. So here, choose one part. I don't care which part. How about let's let u be e to the x and dv to the sine. So then v is minus the cosine and du is uh, dx. Yes. So then this becomes uh, minus cosine minus e to the x cosine x minus a minus takes it minus the integral of a minus cosine dx. Right? Because minus a minus makes it a plus. And then we can do it again. So this guy here is in the same form as this guy. So again, I get parts. I take u to be e to the x, dv to be cosine x dx, the integral of the cosine is the sine, and dv is dx dx. I want to emphasize it's really worthwhile to continue to write the A lot of students leave them off and then they get confused. It's worth putting them on there. Okay, so you do that for this thing. So that means that this becomes what I had laying around before, this, plus what I get from this. So uv is e to the x sine x 
minus the integral of v to the u. Wait a minute, what did I do wrong? And this equals what I started with. So I have, I guess I don't need the parentheses here. So this part from this equal. So I have a thing equals some stuff minus the thing. So that, now we can solve for this, this tells us the two times the integral of e to the x sine x is this jump. e to the x cosine x negative plus e to the x sine x. Uh, and there's, I guess, the constant going around that I neglected. So that means that this integral that I want is half of that jump. All right. So this is the standard kind of thing. You start with something, you mush it around, and you get back with basically what you started with. As you may remember on the exam, you can make this a little trickier by putting a 2 here or a 3 there. But basically this is the, the model problem. Okay? Any other questions about integrations by parts? So those are really the two main methods. The other things like partial fractions, trig substitutions, trig integrals, blah, 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 are all just variations on integration by parts or substitution in special cases where there's special tricks. So uh, I guess I won't get here. So. So another kind of thing might be, say, powers of sines and cosines, or integrals involving trig functions, not inverse trig yet, but trig functions. So something like the integral of sine cube of x cosine x to the, I don't know, fourth dx, something like this. Of course, I can put twos and fives and nines in there if need to, but. Um, so in order to do this kind of thing, we use the most commonly used uh, trig identity, which is basically, which is, remember, the Pythagorean theorem. That one, which allows us to turn even numbers of signs, even powers of signs into cosines, or even powers of cosines into signs. So we use this to manipulate it into something where I make a substitution. What should I do? No, what? Yeah, split off the sine 2x, turn them into cosines, and then make the substitution. So I use the fact here that sine squared x is 1 minus the cosine. Uh, okay. And so then this becomes the integral of sine. Well, let me write it in the end. So sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared. And I have another sine sitting around. And then I have a cosine to the fourth sitting around. And I make the substitution u equals cosine. So du is minus sine uh, dx. And right here, 
I have du. So this becomes then the integral of 1 minus u squared times u to the fourth du such as that. And then you multiply it out and you go from there. Want me to finish or is it okay? So, and these all come down to this kind of thing. Of course, there's, so if you have one of the powers of sine or cosine being odd, then you're in business. If both of them are even, you have to use a slightly more complicated method, which we use a different trig identity. We use the fact that sine squared of x is one half one minus cosine two x and the cosine squared of x is one half one plus cosine two x. <coughs> so we can use this identity to chop the power in half, which then turns us into this situation. Right, so you all did a bunch of those. Does anyone want me to do one of those? No. Okay, good. Alright, so another technique that we have is, say, turning an algebraic thing into a trig integral. Let me just remind you of that. So let's say, I'm not going to have time to do it. Trig substitution would mean that if I have an integral that involves something like, so, So if the integral involves something like 1 plus x squared, then I would make this, I would use the fact that 1 plus the tangent squared is the secant. So I would make the substitution here that tangent of x, no, I'm sorry. I would make the substitution. If you want. I mean, often, so often when you have something like like that, then sure, you would make a trig substitution here. But it doesn't have to be under a radical. It's just that if it is under a radical, it makes it better. Because you can take the right to Right? This, this is, we're, we're thinking here, we're using the fact that 1 plus the tangent squared is the secant squared. So, if we have a radical, then this turns the 1 plus x squared into the square root of the perfect square. So we want to turn our x into a tangent. So here I would make the substitution, x is the tangent of something. Well, if there's a constant around, we can use a constant. So, for example, if I had 5 here, and I would want to transform this into 1 plus x squared, so I would here say, divide u by 5, the u is back, 5 plus x squared is 1 over square root of 5, 1 plus x over square root of 5 squared. And now I would let x over square root of 5 be the tangent. And that's the substitution. And so on. There's other ones too, but I guess we're out of time. So I'll just 
me this way. Um, ow. If there are specific things that you want me to review more than others, you can let me know. If you go on the Piazza site, write them down. Otherwise, I'll just do what I think of as I go through. <laughs> Yeah, that's what you saw. <laughs> <laughs>